All right, hello and welcome to our cover crop panel discussion. I'm Dan Anderson, an associate professor in Ag and Biosystems Engineering at Iowa State University. I'll be having the privilege of moderating this panel. Uh, we have two great speakers. Uh, Melissa Wilson is an assistant professor from and extension specialist in manure and nutrient management. Uh, she is in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate at the University of Minnesota. Melissa has been doing research on cover crops and fall manure application, as well as side dressing manure into standing corn. Recently, she started a new project using manure for hybrid rye production, and as a follow-up, we'll be uh, potentially using that rye as a feed source for organic pork production. Uh, so I think Melissa has a great wealth of knowledge on some cover crops up in Minnesota where they get to have an even shorter growing season than we do. Uh, so make sure you ask her questions about that. I know she has done a lot of work on manure application timing. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what she has to say to us today. Our second panelist will be Dr. Raj Raman. Uh, he is a faculty member in Ag and Biosystems Engineering at Iowa State University. He has a BS in Electrical Engineering and a Doctorate in Agricultural and Biological Engineering from Cornell. His research has encompassed waste management, insect detection, and techno-economic modeling of bioprocessing and waste treatment design. Since 2017, Raj has worked closely with Dr. Ken Moore, uh, who's in the Agronomy Department at Iowa State, on a perennial ground cover initiative at Iowa State. Together, they have an INRC project up at Northeast Re the Northeast Research Facility looking at water quality impacts on perennial ground covers and are kicking off a large USDA NEFA funded project uh, for roughly $10 million on incorporating perennial ground covers, a different version of cover cropping, into corn systems. I think his work is really neat and innovative, uh, so hopefully it'll be a chance for all of us to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, the panelists are going to take about 10 minutes each for a presentation. And then we'll do some questions and answers. So if you have questions during the first 10 minutes, make sure you're noting them down. Uh, and hopefully afterwards, we can have a nice discussion. With that, Melissa. Hello, all. Thank you so much for inviting me down, Dan, to talk about some of our research projects. I'm going to talk about some of our alternative swine manure management practices and what we've been doing up in Minnesota. First one is going to be talking about incorporating cover the liquid swine manure in the fall into cover crops. The idea is could we get cover crops growing early so that we, we could potentially apply manure earlier. Second project then, we'll talk a little bit about side dressing swine manure where we're trying to find an alternative window of opportunity to think about applying the manure that isn't in the fall or spring because as you probably have noticed, at least in Minnesota, the fall and spring have been getting wetter and harder to get manure applied. So thinking about this alternative window of opportunity could be useful. So I'll talk first about our cover crop project. And I just have a couple slides and then talking a little bit about some of the yields that we've been working with. Um, as mentioned, I only have 10 minutes, so I'll try to be brief, but give you some details that are hopefully helpful. Um, one of the things we did is we looked at trying to get cover crops growing as early as possible. So we went in after sweet corn. The sweet corn came off early August. We were planting the cover crops. And we kind of tried a couple different types. We wanted to do winter rye because that will grow in the fall and then survive and grow in the spring. We tried oats because that winter kills. And then we tried a winter rye oat radish mix where half of it dies in the winter and then the rye continues to grow in the spring. And then we also tested an early manure application. And for us in Minnesota, that was mid to, er, mid to late September. Soil temperatures were averaging about 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we also applied manure in late fall in other strips. And the soil temperatures were cooler then. And that's usually in Minnesota when we're recommending fall application, especially with swine manure, which has a high ammonia content. We want to wait till soil temperatures are cool, so that way the ammonia doesn't get transformed into nitrate by soil microbes. Cooler temperatures help slow that down. So the idea was, can the cover crops help us be able to apply manure earlier if we have the right conditions such that, and then trap those nutrients and hopefully release them the next year? Here's some photos that we saw. Um, we saw some nutrient deficiencies actually pretty early in the next year's growing season. This is a photo of oats with early manure applied. So oats were the cover crop. We applied manure early. And then this is oat versus our just our control plots, which we considered fertilizer plots because that's the standard practice. And you can see in these photos that it's a lot yellower where the early manure had been applied down in the lower part of the canopy. 
This is because nitrate is, or nitrogen is movable in a plant. The plant will actually take it from its lower leaves if it can't get it from the soil and move it up to where the chlorophyll is being produced in the plant. So that's why you see this yellowing here, because there's not as much nitrogen in those lower leaves versus in the fertilizer plots. It's a lot greener. We don't see as much lower dead leaves. So we already started seeing that you know, early in the growing season. When we got to yields, we did this over two years in two different fields. So we saw a nutrient source timing effect and we saw a cover crop effect, but we did not see an interaction between the two. So this indicates that in this particular study, those early cover crops weren't helping us trap the nutrients. So if you look at just nutrient timing, which is this first graph, we have yield from zero to 300 bushels per acre. And then we have it separated by year because you know 2020 was a decently normal year in Minnesota. For growth, it was a drought in 2021, so we did see a little bit of differences. One thing to note is though, we have our fertilizer plots. This is spring applied fertilizer. We yielded about 230 bushels per acre between the two years. We significantly reduced yield with our early manure application though in early or early mid to late September. So we saw um, about, what is that, a 13 bushel per acre or roughly um, yield hit when we applied that early manure. Now the difference between the years was this late manure application. We actually saw a 30, yield, 30 bushels per acre yield bump when we applied late manure compared to our fertilizer in one year. And then the fertilizer and late manure were very similar at 220 to 228 bushels per acre in the second year. So it goes to show that soy manure um, does have those added benefits of adding you know, sulfur, the micronutrients, et cetera. So in some years that can really help boost yield, especially in productive years. You know, in a drought year, maybe we weren't getting the release of the, some of those nutrients as we would have liked. Now, when it comes to cover crops, we did see a yield hit with the winter rye. The winter rye got pretty big. We we're seeing 800 to 1,000 bushels, or sorry, pounds per acre of above ground biomass. So when we tilled that under one to two, or killed it and then tilled it under one to two weeks ahead of time, we think two things happened. One, that there could have been nitrogen that was tied up, trying to degrade that residue. Or two, we also just had seed, seeding problems where we weren't getting good seed to soil contact, like drilling into that kind of mess that was going on in the soil. So we think that that's why we saw some yield hits with the rye. Now, I do wanna point out some of my colleagues from Iowa, I don't know if Dan was involved with this study or not, but they are, did this, but they kept growing cover crops year after year and then doing early and late manure. And they were seeing after the second, third year is when they actually started seeing the cover crops, like the early cover crops were able to hold nutrients from the early applied manure and then start releasing it. And that's what we've seen with a lot of cover crop work is that you have to do this multiple years in the same field before you start seeing benefits. So this is just the first year we did cover crops and we didn't see any benefits of the cover crop when it comes to retaining nutrients for the early applied manure, but maybe if we continue this work, we would see that. So what we found so far, get your cover crops planted as early as possible. Again, this might be more um, applicable to Minnesota because we have, I kind of consider it tropical down here when I came down the other day. Um, so we have a lot more growing degree days than you all might here in Iowa. But get your cover crops planted early to get more biomass. Low disturbance manure injection is gonna be key here. If you are tearing up the surface or having really aggressive tillage when you're applying manure into your cover crops, that's not going to let them kind of grow back and reestablish. We were using sweep injections that basically kind of like lifted up the soil, injected the manure into a pocket and kind of set it back down rather than rolling the soil off. And that really seemed to help the cover crops. Um, we did see some reduction in cover crop growth in the fall, but usually by the spring, it had kind of gone up to the same levels where we didn't apply manure. And then finally, applying manure in early fall is still riskier and when the soil temperatures are warm, even with cover crops, at least you know, one year into the system. Again, some other studies have shown that you do multiple years of cover crops, you might start seeing some of these benefits. And then I do wanna talk about side dressing. I'm probably already getting close to my 10 minutes, but um, we started side dressing manure because one of the first things when I came to Minnesota in 2017, talking to farmers, talking to commercial manure applicators, they're having a harder and harder time getting manure applied in the fall across the state because you know there's only so many commercial applicators that can get the manure on and they have to go where they can go. 
So they wanted to see some research looking into alternative windows of opportunity. And a guy out in Ohio, Glenn Arnold, was doing side dressing in um, Ohio with manure. So I said, why not try it here? So we actually went in with a drag hose system. This is an on-farm trial. And yes, the drag hose dragged over corn. And I was standing next to the farmers. He was doing this as the drag hose came by and watching the corn get bent over. He's like, you sure you want us to do this four more times across your field? And he said, yeah, we got to do the research. So it was actually kind of um, fun working with this particular farmer. Uh, what we did is we went in, he put in a base uh, 40 pounds of nitrogen on it planting. We side dressed the rest of the nitrogen with anhydrous ammonia, which was the farmer's standard practice, liquid swine manure, they have a liquid barn. Um, we did a control strip where there was no additional nitrogen side dressed, and then U liquid UAN. We tried to put on the same amount of first year available nitrogen across the plots. And um, one of the reasons the farmer liked this idea is because he has an old style barn built in the 70s. He's not making a full year with his manure storage currently. So if we can figure out this practice and he could do one or two fields with side dressing, he can then make it to the fall. He doesn't have to find a field, a neighbor's field and give it away um, on someone who's growing wheat or something so that he can make it to the fall. So this is a way that you could potentially be using this manure. One of the things you probably see here is these stripes. We did see some striping with the swine manure application. We're not sure if it was a distribution issue or if it was that the compaction behind the drag line system where the tires were going was um, not allowing the manure to infiltrate as well. So maybe we had some ammonia losses there. Either way, we saw striping. I was totally bummed when I saw this photo because I thought the yields were not going to be great. However, they were. We actually, all of the nitrogen sources yielded very similarly between 205 and 208 bushels per acre on average. So overall, anhydrous, dragline swine manure, and UAN were very similar in our first year. So I was pretty pumped. Like if we could figure out these distribution issues, maybe we'd even get better yields the second year. And then the second year happened. I don't know if you remember 2018 and 2019. They were both extremely wet years. Like 2018 was bad, and we're like, it can't get any worse than this. And then 2019 happened. Um, we actually saw a yield hit, um, only 171 bushels per acre. Went back, talked to our commercial applicator who had put it on, talked to the farmer. We're like, what the heck happened here? Turns out um, the applicator, we had been demoing a bar from Bazooka Farmstar, and they didn't adjust the width of the bar when they put it into their system. So we were applying less manure than we thought, just over a wider distance. So luckily, he had taken photos of his monitor, so we were able to figure out what the application rate was. Turns out we had applied about 90 pounds of nitrogen with the liquid manure, you know, first year available nitrogen. And we were aiming for 140. So when you put on 50 pounds less of nitrogen, probably going to get a yield hit. But overall, we feel pretty good about side dressing. You know, the issues that we had are issues we think that we can tweak and make better, like, you know, applying the right rate is always good. Um, but we're feeling pretty good about this. The other thing we did is we're like, all right, so like, how late can we drag corn before it's like irreparably damaged? So we went in and um, put a hose, filled it with water, dragged it behind a tractor. We went up the row and back the row. Because we're like, let's see, like, worst case scenario, what's like the worst damage we could do to this crop? And we went in at um, V1, V2, V3, up through V6. And you can see these photographs here. Um, V6 was definitely like the worst. Like, you should not do this at V6. V5 was also not great. And V4 was like half and half. It depended on the variety we we're using and kind of the year, too. So, Basically, if you're going to be dragging in a cornfield, don't do it after V5 for sure. That's when the growing point comes above the soil. So that's when, like, if you damage that, it's not coming back. Uh, but if it's below the soil, you can actually, like, some of these plants were completely stripped. They were not there anymore. They grew back just fine. Within the next week, they already had leaves growing up. So I was actually pretty surprised. Um, this is actually taken near, a photo taken near campus. I took my son one Saturday when we had to do this. And then I heard him telling his friends the week after that mommy destroys corn for her research program. So I joke now that my program is doing dumb things so you all don't have to. <laughs> so lesson so far, swine manure is a good nitrogen source for side dressing because it is, there's a high proportion of ammonia. So it acts very similarly to just you know, fertilizer. Um, and I have a little asterisk there because you have to apply the right rate. Remember that. You may also safely inject up to V3 for sure, V4, half and half. I mean, honestly, all the on-farm stuff we did was V4. 
and we didn't have as many problems. The one thing you gotta remember is this drag hose isn't going over the entire field because um, it's like they pull up and there's lots of slack and then it just slowly goes through kind of the middle of the field if you know how or think about how they line this up. Um, so V4 is maybe a little risky. Definitely don't go after V5 though. Tanker application, we did just do some studies with some tanker application. We are seeing a little bit more reduced yields with that. We're thinking that's a compaction issue though. Even in this dry year, um, 2021, we saw reduced um, yield where we used a tanker for side dressing and we think it's just a compaction issue. Again, maybe things we can adjust to make better. Maybe we just need to make some tweaks, but it is something that we're trying. All right, sorry, that was probably like 15 minutes, but. Funding sources, contact information if you have other questions. And we will definitely have more time for questions from Melissa. Dan, thanks for having me, and thank you all for being here today. I'm Raj Raman, and uh, I don't know, does this fall under the, do you mind if I stand up? I, I, lecture, I lecture standing up, so maybe I'm more comfortable doing that. Um, this may fall under the crazy talk part of the morning, but the good news is that it'll be short, okay? Um, I've been working for the last four years on a project with the person who was invited originally to give this talk, which is my friend uh, and former bassist in a rock band I was in, distinguished professor Ken Moore, uh, uh, who's an agronomist at Iowa State. Anybody know Ken? We have run into Ken over the years. He was a forage agronomist back in the day, so wrong group of animal producers for me to ask that question to. I do know that much. But Ken, uh, about 15 years ago, got involved in thinking about ways of adding perennials back onto the landscape. You all know that, that 150 years ago, there were a lot of perennials in Iowa, right? That was what the landscape looked like. For very good reasons, we've gotten rid of them to develop an extremely productive uh, food production system, right? But there are things that we lost with those perennials being gone that would be nice to get back. And so the approach that Ken initially took and his uh, students at the time was to look at some native perennials and look at how they could be placed in a field with corn and see whether they could get that system to work. And the answer was, after trying 35 different native perennials, that it was a miserable failure. Okay? Why? Because a lot of those native perennials are in some ways quite similar to corn. They tend to be deep-rooted. They tend to be very active in the middle of the summer. They competed both in time and in space with the corn. And the story, as Ken has told it to me, is that he's, he says, I, I needed to think more like an ecologist. I needed to think about how plants play with each other. And again, coming from a, a forage background, that was really, that's a lot of what forage agronomists do. And he thought about plants that wouldn't be so deep-rooted, that wouldn't be so tall, and that would be active early and late season rather than mid-season. And they ended up starting to try turf grasses. And when they tried turf grasses, what they found, and there's a publication, Wiggins 2012 or so, and I, I should, anyway, I can get the, that material to you at some point. But they showed small plots near Ames that they could get competitive yield, equivalent yield, in plots that had uh, Kentucky bluegrass growing next to the corn. Uh, year one, so they did it four years. Year one, the control significantly outperformed uh, both of the uh, treatments that had grasses. And the reason was, anybody want to guess? That's a great guess. Somebody said moisture here. Wasn't actually the moisture, interestingly enough. In fact, I'm going to jump ahead and say the grass does some things with moisture that aren't necessarily intuitive, or at least not to me, um, which is it tends to be a kind of living mulch and maintain moisture levels more than it does compete for moisture. Now the grass did something else. The grass, because it wasn't suppressed sufficiently early in the season, looked like competition to corn. What does corn do when it sees green, when it pops its head up? It says, oh, we're in trouble. We got competition around here, right? There's a red, far red response that it uses to detect that. And it puts energy into growing tall, tall quickly, and yields drop. 
you'll, in years two, three, and four, they were more aggressive and successful with their suppression of that grass early season. You, you have to do this to make the system work. And in those years, yields were equivalent. With me so far? What we think is exciting or promising about this approach is that it provides a way for people to do a cover crop with significantly less, fewer field operations to maintain it. Plant it once, suppress it annually, that's kind of it. There are a number of benefits that accrue if the system is working well. You get some weed suppression. You reduce soil loss. You reduce nutrient export that comes with that soil loss. You probably can harvest more stover with less environmental burden at the end of the season. You may even have a cover cropping approach here. Well, let me be careful. Let me stop right there and I want to make a disclaimer and then I'll get out of the way and we'll take questions. And Dan will answer all the hard ones because he understands these systems just as well as I do. Better. Uh, something I want to say is that how many of you are cover cropping already? Just kind of curious. So the people of six, seven hands I saw go up. That's excellent. I am by no means trying to convince you that doing this perennial ground cover is better than what you're doing. I actually do not believe that. So you could say, well, why are you even bothering with this? The answer is many of you will know that depending on who you ask, something like 4% of acres in Iowa, maybe five now, are in cover crops, right? There's a lot of acres that are not being cover cropped at all. I'm not interested in trying to convince the people who already have figured out how to make cover crops work for them. I don't want anybody to leave what they're doing for this. But there are a lot of acres that are not being cover cropped, and we think this might be a lower cost of entry way of doing this. You might also say, well, sounds good. You got equivalent yield. Why aren't you telling us how to do this and having a great extension program to, to, to explain to people how to do this? And the answer is, uh, it's, the system is brittle. The system is brittle. If you don't knock that uh, grass back early, you will experience yield losses of 10, 20, 40 percent. That's not acceptable. We, don't, we do not want to be rolling things out that put people in that kind of hazard. Although I'm an electrical engineer by undergraduate training, although I grew up in the suburbs uh, and, and, and went to Cornell, which how aggy was that really? Um, I know enough to understand that farmers manage risk. It's one of the most important things that they do day in and day out. This system that I just described to you as of today is a higher risk system, so we're not pushing people to do this. But we think that if we can develop better best management practices around the agronomics using existing grasses and existing genetics for corn and soybean, we think that if we can get some success with some of the breeders we're working with, and we're working with Corteva, they're partners on this project, um, to make row crops that aren't as sensitive to that red, far red. We're working with grass breeders to make grasses that more readily senesce. We think that if we can do all those things, maybe five years from now, we can start to promote this as something that doesn't add too much extra risk and that brings some very significant benefits. Maybe I'll stop there. And Dan, I'm gonna actually hand it to you because I think you've got some thoughts and clarifications on this that you can provide. Well, first off, we are already doing this with uh, the support of the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Center and Iowa Pork Producers up at our Nashua farm where we do manure research. So this is an example of one of the plots that we had planted to bluegrass last fall and how it went this spring. Uh, Raj pointed out that we really wanted to make sure that we were getting grass kill in the spring, and we violated that rule right away. Since it was so dry and droughty, we chose not to try and spray and senesce the grass this spring in an effort to get a reasonable stand of grass going forward. Uh, you can see it is a pretty weak stand of grass in our corn plot, uh, but by the July 23rd there, you see some pretty tall bluegrass. Certainly it's not like 
cereal rye in the spring or anything near that aggressive, right? But we did get some growth, and you can see it showing up there. Uh, we did collect yield data the first year. We suffered a small yield hit, right? It wasn't, wasn't large, but we did suffer a small yield hit because we didn't terminate the grass. Uh, so I did want to point that out. We have lots of exciting things up there. We have a great grad student. Uh, going forward, uh, we do have this NEFA project, which will hopefully help accelerate some of the work. Uh, but I wanted to point out that you're in on the ground floor, and we're doing some other interesting treatments there as well. Uh, this is just trying to measure NDVI, so light reflectance and how much grass we are growing. You can see right here we're looking at uh, some plots where we interseeded cover crops at roughly V4. Right, so the corn was probably a little taller than I wanted. We didn't get out there until V5, and as Melissa pointed out, when you get out there at V5, if you run over corn, it doesn't come back. Uh, we hit a little bit more corn than I would have wished we would have as we were interseeding. Uh, we have two treatments. Uh, one is a 30 row. I don't have a picture of that one up there for you. And then because we're crazy, uh, we went to 60 inch rows, twin road, right? So every 60, in 60 inches we have two twin rows of corn. Uh, I didn't adjust my manure application there, so my manure is still on 30, right? So one nice manure band for my twin row of 60. Uh, but trying to get more light down to that ground cover and get some more growth, right? So it's interseeded, it's a mixture, most of which will overkill, winter kill, uh, but trying to see how does that impact water quality. We do have legumes in there trying to fix some nitrogen for our corn and get some slow release fertilizer. Uh, just a couple more pictures, because pictures are always nice of, of what it sort of looked like as it was growing. And then, I won't belabor this, but one thing that we have tried to look at is soil health benefits and potential for water quality. Uh, and Raj mentions that the perennial ground cover might have some benefits for that. One of the things that we saw was that the plots where we had perennial ground cover or interseeded cover crops uh, had better aggregate stability. And what's that really mean? Well, those particles are more resistant when raindrops hit them, and because of that, they better let water move through the soil profile down to where we needed it. And of course, in a year of drought, that's really important, right? We wanted to save every drop of water we could and, and get access to it. Uh, so I think that project will continue for the next few years. Uh, we did suffer just a small yield hit on the perennial ground cover in continuous corn compared to our control plot. Our 30 inch ground cover, our interseeded plots looked pretty good. Uh, we had a little little challenge with our 60 inch plots where we both ran over a little bit and then uh, I think the north row didn't yield nearly as well as the south row so we'll have to think about how to overcome that. Uh, but we are definitely on the early stages of, of what's happening there. Melissa mentioned some uh, treatments that we've done in the past, and, and this is sort of comparable to hers. We've done this for four years now where we had manure application timing early and late. She mentioned her early was mid-September. My early is uh, early October, so right since she's north of us, they, they shift everything ahead. So our early to late was early October to uh, late was early November. Uh, we did see a sizable yield cr increase every year by being a month delayed in manure, roughly 30 to 40 bushels an acre, yield improvement by delaying that manure application a month. Uh, we did plant cover crops with the early manure application. Uh, the first year, we suffered a yield hit. We lost something like 16 bushels an acre with cover crop compared to no cover crop with early manure. Uh, every, th every year after that, the cover crop with early manure out yielded the same manure application timing, roughly by five bushels an acre, right? So the first year was a rough one. Things didn't go quite the way we hoped, uh, but we've been slowly building up maybe some of that soil health, some of that slow release nitrogen uh, to get some of that back. So I did want to point that out for you. Uh, the other thing that sometimes if you're a manure person when you see this, the control treatment there always out yielded, right, every plot I had with manure. A couple things. One, that control plot was spring UAN. So all my fertilizer treatments were in, my manure treatments were in the fall, that was spring UAN. And that has tillage. All my manure treatments are no-till, so it's not a fair comparison. We have updated that in our trial going forward. Uh, and the first year showed that when we put on spring UAN with the same tillage treatment as manure in the fall, late manure in the fall, we yielded roughly the same, right? So that is an artifact mostly of tillage. With that, I want to make sure that there's time for audience questions for Melissa Raj. Uh, yes? Yeah, so Melissa, on your early manure application, did you plow that with a, um, a commercial fertilizer for a starter? Yeah, good question. We did plan on putting 40 pounds of nitrogen on at preplant for all of the plots, so we just put it over the whole thing. So we did adjust our nitrogen rates um, down for the manure to knowing that we were gonna put that 40 pounds on. So it's a good question, thanks for bringing that up. And one last question, instead of home dragging, you ever thought about a dribble with a tanker? Yeah, there's actually a lot of, or a couple different 
stribble bar systems that I've seen that are actually automated too, where they don't even have a tractor, they just go out and come back. Um, I think that's really interesting. I know one of the things that uh, Glenn Arnold found out in Ohio is that he had been uh, like surface kind of dribbling it on and comparing it to injected for side dress. And with swine manure, he was finding that it wasn't worth the time to dribble it on the surface because he lost so much nitrogen. With dairy manure, it might be a little bit different because there's less of the ammonia content there. Um, but that's at least what they found in Ohio. We haven't done it yet in Minnesota. They're also doing a lot more no-till. So there's also um, implications there because if there's a lot more stuff on the surface, it's not letting the manure dribble into the soil. Maybe that's you know, making things different than in Minnesota where we don't have that much as much no-till. And sort of on that note, we do have an USDA NRCS CIG grant, a conservation innovation grant here in Iowa that is starting this year. Hopefully by next year we'll be using, uh, if you've seen it, it's Rain 360. It's an irrigation style machine that is supposed to go through the field and dribble, dribble manure on standing corn. So it's a project to demonstrate that both here and in Ohio actually. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some data on what that worked like and how we got it to work. It's, we're using swine manure as the plan, probably finishing manure diluted with a little water to make it flow a little bit better. Uh, right now they are working on manifold designs to make their irrigation system handle that manure a little bit better. Uh, they tried some in Florida for us and it went reasonably well with thin dairy manure, but as they got a little thicker it had some problems, so they're trying to work out their, their design. Uh, so hopefully either late next year or 2023 we should have it for demonstration. Let me know if you want an extra site in Minnesota for that. Yeah, I have some thoughts on it. I was thinking that that would have some differences because when you apply it means that, you know, the carbon, because there's more or less microbes working at different times of the year. So I was thinking that there would be differences. Um, talking to some of the folks that I know that are working in the carbon markets, they said that they don't have any indication of it changing. So their models, they're not using any changes based on timing. And then I also found out that a Apparently they're not really including manure applications as increasing carbon unless you're getting manure from off farm. So if you're applying your own manure, that's technically carbon that was already on your farm. So yeah, heard lots of interesting things about carbon and manure. But. That's right, and I think well, that's the important thing to remember on a lot of those carbon markets is it's changed from baseline. So if you're already using manure, it's sometimes hard to get those carbon credits. In terms of timing and what that has for carbon, I think in the short term, Melissa's absolutely right, right? If we apply later in the fall, some of that carbon will break down more slowly. But over the course of a growing season, probably most of that manure carbon breaks down anyway. I deleted the slide that I had it. I did have some poultry litter data, not swine manure data, because poultry has more carbon, uh, where we did 20 years of poultry litter application near Ames, uh, and we did a standard rate, which was roughly 150 pounds of nitrogen equivalent, and a double rate where we're putting on roughly 300. Uh, and over the 20 years, you saw a substantial, about a 1% increase in soil carbon from the manure. So all manures definitely are building carbon. Some manures will do it more quickly if we're putting more carbon on, uh, but most of the carbon markets want a change from baseline. In terms of arguing for manure application timing impacting carbon credits, you probably would have more luck if someone would argue that that is based on nitrogen use efficiency and related to how much energy it took to use that nitrogen and how effective you were at replacing it, which most carbon markets haven't considered yet. The carbon doesn't come from the ammonia, but when you sort of look at the nitrogen to carbon ratio in the manures, that's what it comes from, right? So when you look at swine manure, we're roughly 6% volatile solids and probably have 0.7% uh, ammonia, right? So the ratio is relatively tight, right? We have lots of ammonia relative to carbon. When I look at poultry manure, I'm something like 0.4% uh, ammonium or nitrogen. And then when I look at volatile solids, I'm something like 0.8% or 0.6%, right? So I have way more carbon relative to nitrogen. So when you think about putting that on your field, I get a lot more carbon every time I put on 150 units than I do with swine manure. Is that fair? Yeah. Think about it with bedding too. Like the turkey litter has some sort of bedding and usually those are high carbon. Um, it seems like the high carbon things soak up the liquids a little better. I don't know, but. Yes, sir. <laughs> 
all manures should be equivalent in terms of yield bump, everything else being equal. Of course, that's easy to say and hard to see in practice, right? We're always trying to apply a certain amount of available nitrogen, let's say, if our system was nitrogen limited. With swine manure, when we look at it, we get to say, well, most of that nitrogen is first year available, right? In Iowa, we're going to say somewhere between 90 and 100 percent. I tend to think it's closer to 100 percent. I believe up in Minnesota, they use somewhere between 80 and 100 percent first year available. It's 80 if it's injected, okay, unless if it's broadcast and incorporated. But when you look at other manures, let's say beef cattle manure, that first year availability is a lot lower, maybe 50 percent, right? So there's a lot of estimates in how much of that is really going to be plant available the first year that is harder to manage. Along with that, you run into all these complications of, and Melissa mentioned this, micronutrients, right? Will your field have a response to micronutrients? Maybe. If you used manure lots of years in the past, I tend to think we have plenty of them. But if you're putting manure on a field that's never had manure before, there's a good chance for a micronutrient response. And then uh, cattle manure tends to have more phosphorus come with that nitrogen, right? So if we're in a field where that where we'd see a phosphorus response, you probably have a better chance of seeing a yield bump from cattle manure applied at the right rate than you would from swine manure applied at that same rate because we're just not moving as much phosphorus. But if we're balancing fertility correctly, they should all be roughly similar. Now with that said, cattle manure also has a challenge where if I try and get all my nitrogen from a bedded pack cattle manure, there's a lot of carbon in there. That carbon ties up nitrogen as it breaks down. And early season nitrogen deficiency might be apparent in your corn, right? It might look yellow. So oftentimes we don't want to get all our nitrogen from cattle manure if that's the case. We'd probably put on a supplemental fertilizer. So it's a complicated question, but they should, if we are getting the right amount of available nitrogen applied in our system and it's uniform, should be equal. Yield. Yeah. Will manure treat um, tied up uh, BHS? That's interesting. We're doing a study where we're looking at nitrogen and phosphorus release from several different manure types. And interestingly, when we calculate the amount of phosphorus that was taken up in corn by how much we put on in the manure, and we tried a bunch of different manure types, um, finishing swine manure, turkey, composted chicken, bedded packed beef, and then two different liquid dairies. One was separated, one wasn't. And we actually found 145% of the phosphorus was taken up in the swine manure plots, which means that it was taking up more from the soil than we had put on, too. So there is, like, at least this happened over two years and four different sites, we saw the same trend. So it seemed like something was going on. I don't know if you've seen that, too, but it seemed like something was making it more available in those particular plots. We didn't see it in the other plots, like in the turkey or anything. It was just in the swine manure, which is really interesting. So I have one, one last point. So is it or is it not that tied to microbial activity? Uh, phosphorus is a little more complicated. Nitrogen is almost pretty much, except for volatilization, it's almost pretty much microbially driven. Phosphorus is when it's organic, but it's a lot of chemical reactions in the soil, so it depends on what you have in your soil, too, to how much gets tied up to, or bound to the soil versus how much is released. Um, the one thing we were wondering is, was the phytase from the pigs being excreted and then still active and then causing the phosphorus to be more available in the soil? It's, we don't have a way to test that in the samples that we have, but it was just kind of a thought that crossed my mind. Yes, sir. What about in post study because what you're talking about microbial activity is pure organic matter. If you look at organic matter in those plots at all, it seems to be higher organic matter. Um, we're looking at ours right now we're starting at pretty high organic matter at these sites. We're already, you know, five percent or above, so it takes a lot more to make changes there. I'm sure if you were um, on a much more low organic matter soil, like it would make more drastic changes. At least that's what we've seen. And we do measure soil organic carbon in our plots with manure. Those plots have been in existence for 20 years. They do get changed in treatments. Right before we started this current one, though, we did do a summary of how it changed from the past treatments, which had manure or manure with cover crops generally. Uh, we saw most plots were increasing in soil carbon regardless of the treatment. Uh, they had moved from a regime where there had been a fair amount of tillage to more reduced till or no till in those plots. So almost all of our plots were increasing carbon, which makes it harder to pick up changes from one treatment relative to the next. Uh, but it is something that we monitor. And then I, we've extended how we're trying to monitor that to include more health, soil health parameters as, as we move forward up there. Uh, I think it is important to try and quantify.
Uh, but we saw pretty substantial soil carbon increases over the last 10 years, more so at a depth of the low 12 inches, 12 to 24 inches, which was interesting to us. Uh, we didn't necessarily expect that, but it was across all plots, which is also interesting. And I wonder if that's related to just greater corn yields and, and more biomass being on the field. Mm -hmm. But it is something we are trying to measure and quantify. I think it's important as we move forward. Uh, we have tried to do it specifically for swine manure and poultry manure uh, with some rate studies. And both of them we saw trends for a different in, in the poultry litter. I mentioned it was statistically significant. We could, could see more soil organic carbon uh, than with our control. With swine manure, since we're adding so much less carbon each time, uh, the plots hadn't shown as much of an increase would be my, my takeaway from it. But certainly it's trending where the plots that had manure for longer periods of time tended to have more soil organic carbon in them, but it wasn't statistically significant yet. Yes? Yeah, and I think better is always a, a tough term, right? I'm an equal opportunity manure employer. <laughs> it depends on what your goal is, right? So uh, right now, swine manures are relatively balanced nitrogen to phosphorus if we're in a corn-soybean rotation, right? They might even be a little phosphorus deficient. And if we already have high soil phosphorus levels, that's great, right? I'd say that's a great manure for our system. On the other hand, if we're in a, a spot where we need to build some phosphorus up in our soil, well, it's hard to do that with swine manure when you're limited by how much nitrogen you can put on. All of a sudden, another manure, poultry litter, where we tend to have more phosphorus coming along with it, can look more beneficial for that reason, right? It, it's bringing that phosphorus with it. And of course, if you're buying litter or buying swine manure, right, or how are we splitting the cost, it always comes down to some economic questions. But I think they have different purposes and different objectives. If I want to see carbon increases in my soil more quickly, well, poultry litter probably offers more opportunity for that than swine manure because it's bringing more carbon along with it. It also offers complications where we don't have very good solid manure injection systems yet, right? So we tend to suffer more ammonia volatilization. Uh, availability of that poultry litter is going to be closer to 60%. Generally, the first year is an estimate. Swine manure is closer to 100%. So you run into some uncertainty about how much nitrogen you may be supplying with it. Uh, so they all have their place, and you have to understand maybe some of the difficulties of managing it. But they can be better for different applications. If I had an, a place where I had degraded soils and I wanted to build carbon, I'm probably looking for a solid manure. If I already have high phosphorus levels and I want to use manure, I'm really looking for swine manure, right? Because it's closer to a nitrogen to phosphorus balance. Turkey and spread, you can't have a clump with that soil. It also has to go like calcium. That's right. So with calcium, you can change your pH some. And maybe that's a benefit, right? If we have low pH, uh, that we can call that a good thing. But you're right. Solid manures often, ha often have clumps. I mentioned earlier that I'm I don't write manure plans when I write a manure plan for people that gets all their nitrogen from solid cattle manure. I don't have enough confidence that it's going to be available. I think I get early season tie-up. Uh, with poultry litter, when I write manure plans, the general concern I have is we put a lot of poultry litter on late fall, uh, maybe throughout the winter. How much of that ammonia do I lose during that time period? How much do I think I need to side dress in the spring to make sure I really can get a good start to my corn, right? Because we don't always get it worked in because of the soil conditions we work with. Where when we work with the liquid swine manure, I'm much more confident that I get it injected. I sometimes worry about the other side of that where we apply a little earlier than we want because of applicator constraints about when they could be there and what was lost to leaching beforehand. So it kind of comes down to what nutrients you really have. Yes, I think anytime you're working with manure, that's really what it is, right? It's a complete fertilizer, but it's not always balanced. And that means we have to think about all those nutrients and how they work together and fit in our cropping system. I think, too, it's important to think about what fields you're putting it on, too. Do good soil testing to make sure you're getting the best bang for your buck for all of the nutrients that are in manure. Yeah? yeah with regard to uh, pit additives that might be used to break up solids or control odors, do you see any differences in um, nitrogen retention, yield impacts, anything? Okay, we've done some work on some manure additives, certainly not all of them. It was supported by the National Pork Board's Pork Producers Association, yeah, National Pork Board, sorry. And it was funded for Yasako Zeal and myself to do some odor control studies and some manure characterizations. Uh, we did not find differences between treated manure and not treated manure with most products. When you carry that, we did find some extra retention of ammonia with certain products, especially polymers where it has potential to grab them, right, and sorb them. Uh, there's potential for that to carry over into the field. On the other hand, 
We should be testing our manure. If our manure had five pounds more ammonia per thousand gallons, nitrogen per thousand gallons, we should be adjusting our rates accordingly, right? So then because of that, you tend not to see a yield increase because I've adjusted my rate to apply the same amount of nitrogen. That's the way the system should work. Now, if you're using a few past years of manure application records, right, and all of a sudden I saw a five pound increase every year, well, that first year I probably get bang for my buck where I put five more pounds of nitrogen on, and depending on what the yield response curve looked like that year, right, if it was a year where I responded well to nitrogen, that five pounds could be valuable. If it was 2012 in a drought, Nitrogen probably wasn't my problem, right? And I probably saw no yield response. So it's a complicated system, but we tend to not see large differences in manure characteristics. Even if you would stop ammonia volatilization, one thing to think about is in a deep pit system, probably about 15% of our nitrogen volatilizes while it's in storage in the pit. Uh, so even if, let's say we get a 15% reduction in that, that sounds a 50% reduction in that, that's a, that's a big number, right? We've really only changed the amount of nitrogen in our, in our manure, the liquid portion where most of it stays, by three or four pounds per thousand gallons. It's not a huge change. Is that fair? Yes? With that question, have you ever looked at uh, humic acid in the pits or in your theory system? Or <laughs> okay. I haven't personally looked at it too much other than when we had foaming manure, I did throw humic acid into the foaming manure to see if it would help reduce foaming. So can you ask me, a, what are you interested in about humic acids? Okay, it probably doesn't actually take us from anaerobic to aerobic. It takes a lot of oxygen to make manure aerobic, and that won't do it. pH changes. If I take a concentrated acid and throw it in manure, something like sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid, I'm probably throwing in a, a gallon for every four gallons of manure to drop the pH to four. So, yeah, it changes the pH a little bit, but it's a tenth of a pH unit generally at the rates we're using it at. With that said, some colleagues at uh, USDA ARS, who are in Ames, have done treatments with humic acids on soils, and they find interesting things like at certain soils it causes more nitrogen release, and they don't really understand why. So I don't want to make too broad of comments about whether it does or doesn't work. The mechanisms they're giving you probably don't make a huge change. When I threw humic acids into manure that foamed, I could turn it into a not foaming manure, which means it was doing something to the microbial community, right? Uh, I don't have a deep enough understanding to give you good mechanisms of why it does some things, but there has been some research that says it can influence uh, nitrogen release from different types of soils. And they, they tended to find that manures that had really high carbon, it didn't do much. Manures that had really low carbon, it didn't do much. And then there was a sweet spot in the middle when they were putting humic acid on soils. Uh, so it's a good question. I think it's an interesting question, along with most manure additives, of how well do they work and, and what really is the science behind them. But it's one that, unfortunately, I don't have great answers for you. Yeah. Cover crops. Average approximate cost per acre with adaptation. Cover crops? Uh, I think for cereal rye, it's generally, depending on how you're applying it, somewhere around $10 for application, $30 for seed, depending on what your seeding rate is. So you're looking at somewhere around $30, $40 to get it applied. Per acre. Per acre. Uh, you can. Sometimes if you have a grain drill and you're doing it yourself, be cheaper than that, right? If you're flying it on, you have less control over it and you, you know, and depending on when you're putting it on, you probably are adjusting your seeding rate somewhat, right? If I'm early, I'm probably more at that uh, 30, 40 pounds per acre. If I'm late, I'm probably putting it on higher so that I actually see some growth. And I think I'm going to send this one to Raj a little bit because I think that's one of the advantages we potentially see with moving to a perennial cover crop system, that bluegrass, where we don't have to pay that seed cost every year. Uh, when I was interseeding cover cro crops at V4, V5, I was using a nine-way mix, and you don't really want to know what I was paying per acre. Uh, I was paying something like $80 an acre to put my cover crops on, which is not great. Didn't make me smile, but it's research on an acre plot, so I didn't feel awful. You're good? I mean, they both, both can work. With the grain drill, you get a nice seed, much more even stand. And for these water quality plots, I've always put it on a, with the grain drill because you can't fly it on a one-acre plot, right? My chance of hitting that plot perfectly isn't very good. It's yeah, it's, it's not cost effective. Well, I get to do a few plots at once, but still, hitting an acre, you're going to have edge effects where I'm either missing my plot or it's going on the next plot. Um, 
when you put it on with an airplane, the same as you were putting it on with a Hagi with drops, right? It's all about soil to seed contact. We give some control of that up to get it planted earlier. If you can get a rainstorm after you apply it, oftentimes you get good germination, good growth. If it sits on the top of the soil and doesn't grow, uh, doesn't do you much good, right? And that's one of the advantages that grain drills have. And actually, we saw that in our interseeded cover crops. Uh, on the 30-inch rows, I was drilling it in, but we couldn't put the two. We were spanning, basically, a row every time we did it. So we had two, two drills on one side, two drills on the other. And I could put the outside drill in the ground. I couldn't put the one closer to the corn row in the ground because I would have ripped up my corn. Uh, and I grew one row of interseeded cover crop, right? The one that was in the ground grew. The other one, I didn't get rain for three weeks. That seed was all eaten up by the time I finally got some rain to help it grow. Yeah. So we've had pretty good luck too with um, like with soybeans. If we can get it on it right before leaf drop, then the leaves kind of drop over and trap some of that moisture. That can be helpful too. In our study, if any time we broadcast it in leaf drop for soybeans, that was better than drilling, waiting to drill after harvest. So if you can't drill it and you can get it on, and you know you're going to get moisture, and moisture is key. You need to get moisture within a week. Um, then it seems to do pretty decent. Earlier is always better if it's going to grow. So, right, you'll get cover, more cover crop growth with those growing degree days. So I like earlier, but if it's dry, you're not going to get rain. Yeah. It, it's tough. Yes. No, but I'm glad you brought up grazing. My feeling is that at least in the early renditions of this approach, which are focused on getting onto a lot of acres, we're not going to presume any grazing. That usually makes people recoil because they say, what part of getting value out of a plant that you're growing, don't you understand, Raj? <laughs> and if you feel that way, that's fine. Let me, let me tell you the way I think about it. I understand that with annual cover cropping, it makes a lot of sense, and it's often possible to get a dense enough stand that you may be able to do something, including grazing, right? Some, some, you get some kind of economic benefit from that. I think what's different about this perennial cover, ground cover approach in particular with this kind of uh, turf grass, is that you're really, the, the economic argument in my mind goes like this. You're gonna get equivalent yield, maybe even a little more. By the way, uh, I think there was a comment made about soil structure, and anecdotally, some of the fields that one of our partners had in uh, perennial ground cover uh, during the derecho showed a lot less lodging. Why? Structure, right? So you, so, the pitch is this, you're going to get to have something on the ground essentially year-round that's going to provide ecosystem services, some of which you derive direct economic benefit from, maybe a little bit of better soil structure, et cetera, some of which you don't. We understand that. Um, the one thing that might really put, some of those provide a little bit of dollars. The one that probably provides the most dollars for somebody doing corn is that you could harvest more stover. Right, um, But the big thing that you get is a lower, forgive me saying it this way, a lower hassle and lower cost cover, something that you plant once and then kind of you need to knock back. But beyond that, you don't do much with. And the truth is, oftentimes in these systems, the cover is not so robust that you'd really think that it was even worth having animals out there. Okay, but I, I love the question, and it's an important point that in, a, in the long version of my talk, I spent a lot of time talking about how this is really a little bit different from what you normally think of with, with a cover crop. Um, we still think, ideally, if we get it right, that we can make this attractive economically to people, but not because of the direct benefit of having that thing on the ground in terms of a, a, another thing to harvest or, or feed. Thank you. In terms of the amount of biomass we had on the surface this year, just to help you put it in perspective. Uh, with that perennial ground cover, the bluegrass. Now, it was the year of establishment. It was a tough year. We had a little less than a tenth of a ton per acre, right? So relatively Wispy. small amounts. Wispy, right? So you're probably not going to send an animal out there to graze it. With our interseeded cover crop, we finished off somewhere in the neighborhood of a ton to two tons an acre at the end of the growing season. And often with cereal rye in Iowa, I tend to think of somewhere in between a ton 
and two tons of cereal rye in the spring that you could potentially graze, right? So we're minuscule amounts of cover crops. So grazing probably is a tougher one to go out there, unless you're a cow-calf where you're really trying to graze your corn residue, maybe rather than the actual growing biomass. Is that fair?